Well, welcome everyone to St. John's. Don, it's really great to see you. I haven't seen Don in uh, maybe 15 years, yeah. uh, not more than that. Uh, some things have changed since I saw yeah. you last. So, yeah, um, my gray hair. Yeah. And um, I wanted to just begin, for those of you who don't know Don, um, with a, reading a little bit about who he is, and then I'll offer just a personal kind of anecdote about uh, our connection as well. And, and Don said, don't take too long reading, uh, you know, Please. introducing me, but I, I'm sorry, you're going to have to deal with it. No. Um, so here, it's, it won't be too long, but um, people need to know, Don, that you are uh, an ordained Presbyterian minister. Uh, Don is most recently retired as the National Program Director for Friends of Seville, uh, North America. And prior to that, he served as the director of the Center uh, for Middle Eastern Studies at Chicago's North Park University. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, as the national director of the Palestine Human Rights Campaign and as the director of Middle East Programs for Mercy Corps International. Um, Don also served churches in New Jersey and Evanston. If you've read the book, you've gotten a lot, a sense of that and how uh, transformative that was for him. Uh, he is co-founder of Evangelicals for Middle Eastern Middle, Middle East Understanding and is the author of five books, the most recent of which is entitled Glory to God in the Lowest Journeys to an Unholy Land. And that's um, what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, when I asked Don at first uh, how I should introduce him, he said uh, to say that he is a typical white American Christian uh, who has had the privilege of learning from those who are disenfranchised and victims of injustice. So I think that was, it. Um, uh, it's gonna be a, a part of our discussion tonight. So anecdotally, just on a personal note, uh, those of you who read the book, you'll know that uh, Don started a, a program where um, North Park was bringing Palestinian students from uh, Palestine to study at North Park uh, College, which I understand is a North Park University, yeah. all right? Um, and so I had several friends that were there and my freshman year in college in the South in Alabama, was okay, but by the second year, I was ready to move somewhere else. So I, <laughs> I, um, we we connected, and Don said, "Why don't you come up?" And I stayed with one of my Sunday school friends, um, who was a, a a year ahead of me there, and um, we were this close to me uh, going yeah. to North Park College, and um, uh, it didn't work out. And that's another story because it was uh, meant to be. So, right. uh, welcome, Don. Really Thank good to have so you. Let's welcome Don together tonight. <laughs> I what? must add that yeah. I made the mistake of bringing Sari to Chicago in the middle of January. <laughs> that is true. It was 10 below. That, that is true. That was two strikes. Yeah. Already. Um, so, uh, Don, you've written, written several books, but this one is different um, because it's a memoir. And I thought it would be nice to hear from you um, just as we start on a kind of personal note. What, what was it like kind of going back through your life from start to where you are now? This was my pandemic project, and some of you probably have had writing projects during the pandemic. And uh, I began writing a bio autobiography for my children so that they would know what I was involved in and who I am, and the grandchildren. I have six now. And I just thought that uh, that would be my last book. And self-publish it, just get it to the family, la-di-da, that's it. Uh, Linda, who is finishing dinner, will be here in a minute, my wife, started reading and said, some of these stories are pretty interesting. I, I, I think you should get a wider audience. Well, I'm listening to my wife, as I often don't do. She uh, got a lot of wisdom. So I then began to read about a memoir, which is very different from an autobiography, where you take two or maybe three themes at once and ruthlessly write about them to show your transformation across time. So that's what I did. Uh, growing up in a really conservative Christian Zionist, which we'll get into, uh, fundamentalist Christian background, uh, and very conservative Republican uh, family. Then uh, being politicized and raised my conscience in seminary when I went to Princeton Seminary and encountered the anti-war movement in Vietnam, then the civil rights movement, and that was a political awakening. 
and liberation theology, which just jarred my narrative, completely jarred my whole evangelical understanding of Jesus and the individual <laughs> journey. Uh, and then the call to justice, which I had been missing. So that was very transformative. And then a few years later, Palestine, which was, uh, which we'll talk about, which was really a tougher road to hold. So um, those three themes became part of it. And as I wrote, I found how humbling it was for how much failure I've had in my life, uh, but also how much the Palestinians, my African-American black friends in a black church, which was my first church, how they loved and mentored me and showed amazing hospitality so that I could grow up and mature, you know, as a Christian and as a, as a leader. So I guess those are Thanks, Don. some yeah, of it. This is definitely, uh, the memoir is a story of transformation. Even you talk about it being, um, you say this memoir follows my political and religious transformation through a series of events and what I call the downward journey yes. of justice. But before, before we get into that, because I'd love to hear from you what, what you know, the, the, uh, what you mean by downward journey, but to give the audience a, a, a contrast um, from where you were, how you started, and where you are today. Um, in one of your previous books, you talked a little bit about um, Armageddon, and you talked about the rapture. Yeah. Um, these are not this is, these are not terms that we use very often in the Episcopal Church. <laughs> um, so uh, tell us uh, a little bit about your kind of uh, that you know an anecdote uh, about your experience with yeah. uh, with that whole mentality. And yeah. the, the well, cut me short, because, oh, yeah. because this could be long. Well, um, my mom and dad. Uh, and my maternal grandparents were very active and loving evangelical Christians, but they and they read their Schofield Bible faithfully. Every night, my grandfather and grandmother pulled out the Bible and had Bible study, and they followed the Schofield notes. Uh, I don't know how many are familiar with the Schofield Bible, and Okay, two. I better say a little bit more. <laughs> a couple this new This is good education. This is good education. Uh, okay. Well, it developed. It was published in 1909, but it follows a certain type of theology that is a very it takes a very narrow slice of the end times. And it really is uh uh it has its own hermeneutic, its own interpretive key. And they look at certain issues as forecasting the end of history. And among them are the rise of Israel as a nation, the rise of the Antichrist. And we were always trying to guess who was the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, it was, uh, yeah, I think it was the Pope for a while. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> and then it became the Soviet Union. So the evil empire, whatever it is, so you focus on that, that that person is alive in our time. And then uh, Israel will conquer and take Jerusalem. And eventually, I'm making this very short, mm -hmm. eventually the kingdoms of the north will come down and attack Israel in the last days. And in the midst of it, Israel will be losing that battle. Two thirds of the Jews will die. And then suddenly Jesus returns, but before he returns, he conveniently pulls the born again Christians out of history in what's called the rapture. So the born again Christians don't have to go through the suffering. And then finally, Jesus is a military warrior Messiah and he defeats Israel. Yeah, some of you are laughing, right? <laughs> but you know, I was steeped in that and I believed it. And one night, my, my dad was in the war, and my grandparents really had a lot in terms of raising me. I didn't see my dad from the time I was six months to three and a half, because he was in World War II. Um, and I'd love to go back to that farm, spend time with grandpa and grandma. And one night they said, well, we're not doing Bible study tonight. We're going to a revival. I'd never been to a revival. Okay, that'll be fun. So we come into the church a little bit late. It was the middle of July, and probably 95 and really hot and humid. 
uh, which was a nice condition, you know, to think about the rapture and the fire of hell and everything. The preacher, the evangelist, was on his last night of a series, and he was about a six foot five former wrestler who converted to Christianity. He had this raspy voice, and he was talking about the lake of fire and the Antichrist. And then he gets to the rapture, and he said, you're going to have a chance to come forward and confess Jesus as your Lord. But if you don't, you're taking a chance because the rapture could come tonight and you'd be left behind. Well, it kind of shook me up and I was a little bit scared. So I didn't go forward, but I made a prayer in my heart. Jesus, I believe. And, you know, I did the formula and uh, I didn't go forward. Then on the way home, my grandparents were driving us and uh, I was really kind of spooked and, and freaked out a little bit. So we finally get to the farm. I go right to bed and I hardly slept that night. You know, all the animals, the screech owls, the cats fighting and everything. You know, just, I was just really freaked out. Finally, I fell asleep and slept in and ran down and uh, fixed my breakfast because grandma wasn't there. And it was about 11 o'clock. And then I went, geez, where's grandma? So I walked out to see if she's in the tomato patch, getting tomatoes and lettuce for lunch. No grandma there. Uh, I walked out over to the cherry orchard just to the right, adjacent to the house. And there were ladders up in the trees where the workers were picking cherries, my grandpa and grandma the day before. There were ladders up and nobody on them. So I said, oh, oh. I ran around a little bit, went down to the barn. Grandpa wasn't there. And then I thought, I didn't go forward. I didn't do it right. <laughs> And I've been left behind. <laughs> and seriously, I knelt in the driveway crying, looking up in the sky if I could see Jesus and people rising. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought, um, how am I going to manage this farm at six years old? And, and then uh, I heard voices. Grandpa and Grandma just took lunch to the sick neighbor next door. I was so thrilled it's and such relieved. Such a good story. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> but that's my rapture story. And And it's... Uh, psychologically, when you're that age, and I think many of us can probably identify with this, when you're raised with a particular mentality, or yeah. uh, it goes deep, and it's hard, oh. it's hard to yeah. shake that kind of stuff, yeah. even in your adult life. Right. There's always a part of you that uh, wonders if you're getting it right, or you know, because of how impressionable we are. Yeah. You uh, know, and that that's such a fear-based theology, mm. and interestingly, it jumps over most of the gospel. And certainly the justice passage is like Matthew 25. Uh, when I was thirsty, did you give me drink? When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was a prisoner, did you visit me? It ignores all of that. But it develops a certain end time theology. And of Israel is at the center of it. Yeah. And that's why it has been politicized, uh, in, mostly in recent years. Yeah. And, and you, um, this is good. And we're definitely going to get to, I want to dig a little bit deeper into um, Christian Zionism and its impact today and, and, and all of this. Um, but tell us a little bit. So there, you say in your book that there was still quite a bit of resistance um, that was, you know, these pieces that still you were holding on specifically related to Israel, even though you were becoming more awake to social justice issues, yeah. Yeah. Um, not the Palestinian. It's almost like the Palestinian Israeli um, issue that was one of the last ones that you were opening up to. But tell us a little bit about your kind of the beginning of your awakening in regards to social justice. Like you, you talk about um, going to Princeton and that first year was very transformational for you. Yeah, you took a really. class with a liberation theologian. Mm -hmm. You went down to Washington, D.C. Give us a sense of that just okay. so we can follow yeah. your journey. Still very much an evangelical. And uh, I mean, evangelical has gotten a bad name of late. It's an umbrella term. And there's a progressive wing and there's a far right wing and a lot of folks in the middle. And I was probably kind of in the middle, still very evangelical. So I take this course on liberation theology from Richard Shaw, Shaw uh, who called himself kind of a Marxist Christian. He came out of South America as a missionary and became a liberation theologian. And during these years in the mid to late 60s, it was really becoming strong in Central and South America. 
the liberation theology movement. So he passed out the syllabus the first day. And uh, I was a little taken aback because among the readings was Chairman Mao's Red Book, uh, Marx and Engels, uh, the uh, autobiography of Malcolm X, a few Bible references and passages. But, you yeah, know, a lot of antichrists to pick from. Oh, yeah, I said, I didn't get much of this in college or at home. So, uh, OK, so he was up there teaching us with kind of a Marxist critique. And among those themes were the preferential option of the poor, mm. that God has a preferential option of those who are victims of injustice. And therefore, we as disciples have that prophetic responsibility to change society, to heal those wounds. Uh, this was totally new for me. Um, it took me a while to really get that. Um, then I, uh, I was looking around for a church. I visited two or three to see if I could uh, pastor those churches. And I, I ended up. Uh, thinking, well, I haven't found anything I really feel called to or like, so I'm going to go on and get a PhD in theology at Princeton University. Just about the time I was filling out the application and checking out that program, I got a call from the pastor I was working with as a seminary student, kind of an intern. It was a black church right on the border of Newark and East Orange, New Jersey. And I had done my master's thesis on the uh, Newark riots and the failure of the church to respond. So I was quite familiar with what was going on. And uh, he said, hey, Don, I mean, we have been thinking that we need an associate pastor. The church had grown incredibly under this pastor, Joe Roberts. It had just taken off and uh, he needed an assistant. He said, we've decided to bring you. I said, whoa, talk about humbling a white guy in an all-black church, and uh, I'm still learning my way. And he said, no, we really want you to prayerfully consider this. So I talked it over with my wife, and uh, we decided, hey, this is what we want to do. And um, that church just loved me where I was, allowed me to make mistakes and come along. And you'll see all this in the books, I'm really funny things and strange things. And uh, eventually, uh, I just really worked on my white supremacy growing up as a kid, reflected on that, and was helped by this congregation lovingly to work through all that. We were also twinned with a synagogue in Newark. And that's important because during the riots, a lot of the black shops were burnt down. And there was a lot of resentment toward black uh, businesses. So we were trying to work on the anti-Semitism and, and bring healing and reconciliation between the two. And in that process, I became very much of a, what I call now, a mainline liberal Christian Zionist. Uh, out of the post-Holocaust, that we need to stand with the Jewish people. We have that Christian responsibility that it will never happen again and we need to stand with them right or wrong. But yet through that, I knew nothing about the Palestinians, absolutely nothing except what I read in the New York Times. And that wasn't always very accurate. Yeah. Don, uh, I, I wanna, I'd love to transition to uh, kind of the stark moment where you were standing in Sabra and Shatila Ooh, and, yeah. um, and ask you if you would just read, maybe give us a, a little bit of background if, we're, if we need it um, yeah. and then, you know, read that section and then, and then we'll. We're jumping over a lot of territory here. We are. <laughs> but uh, I eventually got the calling in the sense of uh, the Palestinian injustice is a major factor. And I had that change of heart first in a church in a course where people like you were coming to learn about this issue. And I heard narratives about Palestine, like a professor who was driven from Jaffa and lost everything in the, what they call the Nakba, the catastrophe, when Israel was created. The people of Jaffa were driven at gunpoint on a death march. Many survived, many didn't. That story jarred my narrative. 
And then uh, once I made my first trip to Palestine and in Lebanon, I saw the refugee camps, I saw the suffering, the pain, and I really felt in my heart, this is something I need to give my life to. I didn't know how it would happen. And, uh, but to make a long story short, read the book, <laughs> uh, I wound up in um, 1982, taking two groups. I was by then full-time as the director of a group called the Palestine Human Rights Campaign, where I learned a lot and failed a lot. And the best education is to take people over there. And I think you've done that in this church. You know, we have to cut through all the narratives we have, the confusion, even the biblical texts and theology, and see the suffering and to meet with the Christians and the Muslims and progressive Jews who are trying to bring justice and see how hard it is. So my second trip in 1982 was with two leaders from Mercy Corps. We had been in, there in June with a group of nine relief and development people and got trapped in the invasion of Lebanon and were under the bombs. And one of them was a CIA, you said, uh, yeah. infiltrator, which we is found interesting that later. in the book. Yeah. yeah, we found out that later. Um, so we decided we have to go back. And I wrote a proposal to develop a close relationship between Western evangelicals and Middle East Christians and to bridge that gap. The Mercy Corps people developed two, two proposals, one to work with the Red Crescent, with the Palestinian uh, relief group and their hospitals uh, with refugees. And the other was kind of an education portfolio so that this, you know, this really uh, evangelical based uh, relief and development group would partner with Palestinians in Lebanon during these years. So we had those two proposals and uh, we land in Cyprus because the Beirut airport had been destroyed. So we had to take a boat and we hopped in the boat and the first report of the Sabra Shatila massacre came over the BBC. The driver said, you're going nowhere. So we got a hotel, then we're able to get the boat the next day. We land at the port of Junia up in the north of Lebanon, took a cab and rushed down to the Middle East Council of Churches where Gabi Habib, the director who just passed away a few days ago, uh, was briefing doctors and nurses who were working. Uh, tomorrow night, Ellen Siegel was one of those doctors and will be having a panel at Bus Boys and Poets at seven about this. Mm -hmm. Um, so we went into the camps, Gabi Habib said, get over there. You've got to see what has happened. And we walked in. And and, just to clarify, this is the Palestinian refugee camp. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sabra and Shatila. Not, and it isn't exclusively, but mostly Palestinian refugees. Uh, but also poor Shiite Lebanese were there in those camps. And what had happened was the president of Lebanon, newly elected just two or three weeks, Bashir Jamal was blown up in his compound. And of course, all of his followers, mostly Christian uh, Maronites, were uh, terribly upset. Ariel Sharon and one other Israeli visited them and blamed the massacre on the Palestinians and the PLO. The PLO had been evacuated three weeks earlier. So these camps and Palestinians were left without a defense. And Lebanon was quite chaotic in those days. So I'll start, uh, and I'll just read a few paragraphs. It was Monday morning, September 20, 1982. I was sitting on a pile of dirt from a mass grave as we watched Red Cross and Red Crescent workers bury Palestinians below us. When I arrived at Cyber Shatila re refugee camps, they're twin right next to each other, in southern Beirut, I was quickly overcome by the emotional overload and the intense heat. <clears throat> Palestinian families were just returning for the first time since the massacre, which ended the previous day, to see if there were parts of their sons and daughters buried under the rubble. A few minutes earlier, I watched as workers pulled decaying bodies of two small children from the rubble. Their mother cried out in Arabic, 
translated, why, O oh Allah, why, 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 just in agony. The piercing screams cut through to my heart and soul. Then I saw the parade of body bags coming in front of me, possibly 300 to 400, taking victims to their final resting place. We had to cover our mouth and nose with handkerchiefs doused in cheap cologne to offset the intense stents of death that permeated and destroyed the refugee camp. It really would make you sick if you didn't have that in front of you. I never witnessed such a concentration of death and suffering in one place. I hope I never will again. I had to sit down for a moment and found that dirt pile where a group of French journalists were sitting. I heard the woman beside me crying and asked how she was holding up. She said through her tears, I've been covering this God awful war all summer, the civil war. And now this massacre, this is utterly beyond my comprehension. Then she asked the dreaded question, where are you from? I hesitated because I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed to admit I was from the United States. Three weeks before the massacre, the United States signed an agreement to guarantee the protection for 400,000 Palestinians, mostly refugees, such as those in the camps. Then the PLO was evacuated. The United States completely reneged on this promise and betrayed the Palestinians, hence my embarrassment. I'm sorry, I said, I must admit I'm from the United States. She surprised me and said, you're not alone. France also signed that treaty and we have equal responsibility. It's our responsibility now to go and tell what we're seeing. Our conversation was interrupted by another blood curdling cry from a mother and or a daughter. Another body was found, the child was pulled. And this time the mother said, why, oh Allah, why, why, why is this our destiny as Palestinians? Why, oh Allah? We bowed our heads and wept. Then I asked the journalist, do you have any idea how many are being buried as we watch this mass grave? She said, no, I was counting, but I've lost count. Then she pointed to my right. There was a, they were digging another mass grave equal in size. At that moment, I saw a Muslim, Muslim sheikh walk by and I excused myself. I ran to catch up with him. I extended my condolences for what had happened. I asked, uh, was he the sheikh at the local mosque? And his English was excellent. And he said, yes, I saw many of these people Friday at prayers and now look at what has happened to them. I asked if he had any idea how many were killed. He said, we will never know. The workers will never be able to recover all who were bulldozed under, the, under their homes. But worse, I saw with my own eyes from looking in front from the mosque, the, the militias lined up hundreds of civilians, mostly men, and machine gunned, the, the, machine gunned them to death. Then the trucks rolled up. They were thrown into the trucks and buried. And we'll never know where they are. I shook my head, thanked him for taking time. Then he asked, where are you from, my friend? Again, I was about to say Canada. <laughs> But I had to be honest, I apologize for what my country has done to you and all of Lebanon and to these Palestinians. I'm sorry to say I'm from the United States and the blood is on our hands. He said, yes, the blood is on your hands as Americans. Then he surprised me and he said, but I thank Allah you are here. I thank Allah that you are here to witness this today. Now. You must return home and tell what you have seen. All we ask of you is just go home, tell the truth. I promise this is what I would do, change my life. Don, there's... Um... 
we could fill three hours, you and I talking. Yeah. I, I want to ask you specifically, <laughs> one of the things that you that I, I found powerful in this book is your um, struggle to try to get the word out in the media oh. about what was actually happening. And at one point you describe a scene where um, there, you know, you were not permitted to go into the actual NBC um, studio. Right. Um, and, and maybe it's up to you if you want to tell that story oh, or not. Yeah. But the part that I, I'm really curious about is uh, you were talking about media censorship. And I am curious if things have changed over the last uh, 40 years since, you know, that observation and that major frustration that you had. Are things changing in the media, especially in America, related to um, the Palestinian narrative in right. the story? Well, let me tell that story. It, it actually took place right after I came out of the bombardment uh, in June in 82 and uh, came back and just, I was very angry and, and just guilty and, but really upset with watching the F-16s manufactured by our country, dropping bombs over civilians and being on them, you know, and really, I mean, we, we weren't that close, but uh, six, eight blocks away is, is a little challenging. And um, so, I came back to Chicago and I called ahead to my staff and I said, um, we've got to get some media because the story is not being covered. I knew that because two days before we left, uh, we witnessed in Gaza hospital bodies of young girls being brought in who were bombed by Israeli air force and well-marked United Nations camps, they were on a field trip. 19 of the girls came in as body bags. Others, their limbs, their legs blown off. It was, I, I just get chills remembering that scenario. We went over to um, try to contact a couple studios, Dan O'Neill and I, who's the president of Mercy Corps. And we finally found a guy named Mike Mallory, who's the chief bureau correspondent from NBC at the time. And he said, nothing is getting through. Everything is being censored in New York. So he said, well, maybe because you guys are from the US, let's give it a try. So he filmed us. We told that story and others. He said, I'm gonna, at those days, you had to send it up the mountain to be picked up by the satellite and relayed to New York. So that happened. So we called our families and friends and said, watch NBC. There might be a breakthrough. Nothing. So I knew this was going on. Um, so then my staff got me an interview with, ironically, NBC Chicago. And the person doing it was a fellow named Tim Weigel, who I knew because he was a sports commentator and I'm a sports addict, but he was switched to the news this day. And uh, so he said, um, okay, we're gonna interview at four o'clock, but we want you to be interviewed down in a park by the lake. Uh, and General Shromi, the Israeli general who's on tour will be in the studio. And I said, oh, wait a minute. Um, I'd like to be in the studio with General Shromi and you. Uh, why not? He said, well, these are the instructions we got from the Israeli consulate. Well, I said, I mean, who's running this program? I think you should call them and take charge and stand up to this. I wanna be in the studio. He called back and said, someone else on the staff had already made the arrangements. You're going to have to be in the park. Okay, so I was in the park. And uh, the Shrom, General Shromi gave a passionate defense of Israel. They called it peace for Galilee, that invasion. That This was our defense. And uh, it was a defensive operation. It wasn't. Israel did the first bombing. Um, so anyway, he rambled on about that. And I said, and then I intervened and said, well, how do you account for the number of civilians that are being killed? I, I saw myself, a hospital, a wing had been, been hit. I told the story of the young girls. I told the story of the carpet bombing in the Fakani district of, of Beirut. He said, oh, no, we are very precise in our bombing. Uh, we are hitting only military targets. And, uh, and then he said, and we have planned this 
as the final solution to the Palestine problem. That's all I needed. I jumped on that and said, I've studied the Holocaust extensively. And isn't that what the Nazis said about your people? How can you use that in this situation against the civilians who are being killed and against the whole people? Shame on you. And uh, the uh, interviewer cut the program short. <laughs> yeah, he did. And, and then I, I went back to the office and I wonder, geez, maybe I was a little too harsh with him. And uh, Tim Weigel called and said, uh, I got to tell you, our switchboard has never lit up as much as your interview. And it's all hate calls. You will never be back and have an interview with us. So that was that, a good learning experience. Yeah. Um, now, I think things are slightly better. I think we have a, a few networks which will look at the Palestine question. But just look at all the hits in Gaza. It's always from the Israeli military narrative, a defensive posture. This last strike in Gaza, Israel initiated it. And how many Palestinians die in these? There isn't that sensitivity yet. So I th think we have a lot of work to do. We can't just say this is the power of the lobby. Um, they hear from uh, the lobby and it's very well organized. They get plenty of uh, press releases and everything else, speakers, and we just haven't done the job. So I think we as churches, as Muslims, as progressive Jews really have to deal with that. And Linda, who is here, my wife in the back, we visited a congressperson today, and uh, I won't say who, but it was very, she's very savvy. She's been to Palestine, the West Bank. But when we raised certain issue, one of which was the child detention that Israel needs to stop picking up and kidnapping children and imprisoning them, and that this bill was linked now to U.S. aid because it violates the Leahy Law and the U.S. Arms Export Control Act. She said, you who advocate this made a huge mistake calling for a cut in aid to Israel. We were okay with you just focused on the children. But when you get over into this territory, we took our name off that. So that's how far we have to go. So she understands it. She's sympathetic with the Palestinian narrative. She's seen it. She's against the settlements. But boy, when it comes to aid, there's no traction. Um, so maybe we're a ways away from that. So I, I think things are changing. I think some of our best assets are the young Muslims from American Muslims for Palestine. Young Jews, an increasing number, they say, well, the Jews under 35, and I see it in Chicago, are not buying the old Zionist narrative. Many are embarrassed by what Israel's doing. And now our churches, our churches are rising up and, and uh, making the case. So I, I see significant hope, but it's almost, we have to work from the bottom up to educate our parishes. We pass nice resolutions, but they don't filter down until we do the work. And, uh, and we have to still though work at the top. We don't have the power at the top. This is where Israel and their support uh, of both parties is strong, but we have to keep Pecking away. The Palestinians have a word, Samud, steadfast. You never give up. And you know that wonderful parable, I think it's in Luke 9, where Jesus tells the story of, of, the, of the widow who's been wronged and she has to take her case to an unjust judge. And uh, it says, This judge loved neither God nor people. And I think we have a little bit of that. Mm. Um, and she, however, is steadfast. She hammers on the door and it implies she doesn't let up. She knocks, knocks on the door day after day. And the, and the text says, and the judge finally says, give her justice. She's wearing me out. That's our call. Wow. 
Well, Don, speaking of um, the way that you're talking about educating our parishes, I, one thing that you said in your book, you said that at one point in your approach to Middle East issues, you believed in what you would later see as the myth of balance. <laughs> uh, the myth ignores the imbalance of power, yeah. including economic, military, and political factors yeah. that surround the Arab-Israeli issue. And to so much so now that you don't even say you don't even use the term Palestinian Israeli conflict because no. that feels like an inaccurate um, statement. Say a little bit about even the word conflict as being yeah. something that we shouldn't be maybe using. Well, I mean, is this is one of the most embellished conflicts on the planet and always has been going back to the Belfort Declaration right on through uh, that Israel, um, well, first the Zionist movement had the backing of the British Empire. And when they backed them and issued the Belfort Declaration, November 2, 1917, I think it was, that Palestine was, the population was over 90% Palestinian, Christian and Muslim. And many of the Jews there were, they got along. They, they were in each other's uh, uh, marriage, uh, marriage services. They attended Christmas or uh, you know, the Muslim ceremonies. Uh, so they really were, um, I don't know, the Palestinians were the majority population, but the British chose the Zionist movement for two reasons, because it could advance their colonial interests, whereas the Palestinians would resist them. So they would become a settler colony promoted by the British, taking the land of another people that the British facilitated. That started in 1920, if not earlier. So that was part of it. But also, um, a couple of the British politicians, Lord Balfour, who drafted that with the help of the Zionist lobbyists, and David Lloyd George, the prime minister, were raised in fundamentalist Christian homes who were Christian Zionists. They were predisposed to the Zionist narrative. And these European Jews who lobbied them, hey, they're kind of like us. We don't know that we can trust. So there's a lot of racism toward the Palestinians as the other. And the Zionist movement was clever in the way they marketed that. And David Lloyd George and Belfort didn't do it for theological reasons, they did it for colonial control mm -hmm. because they, the Brits wanted control uh, from the Mediterranean all the way over to the jewel in the empire. What's that? India. India. And that included all the Arab world and oil had just been discovered. So it was colonial, totally a colonial move. But uh, Christian Zionism played a small role in predisposing these British uh, politicians too. And we have that syndrome today very much in uh, many evangelicals, I would say fundamentalists in our House and Senate. Yeah. So, so um, what would you use instead of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Oh, I didn't get to that. No, it's, it's good. Yeah, thanks. He's, he's good. <laughs> yeah. So um, given that imbalance from the British, then when the United States took over from the British in, in the 40s, uh, we really embraced Israel. And uh, so the Zionist movement has always had, and Israel has always had, an imperial backing behind them. Um, so if you look at this thing today and jump into our present area, Israel not only has, uh, they receive four point plus billion a year from us, more than the entire continent of Africa, if you pull out Egypt. And that's only what is reported in the general accounting office. It's much higher, high degree of, and it's almost untouchable as we've heard again today with this uh, congressional aid. Aid to Israel is a sacred, sacred cow. Um, so that's there, plus they get the, latest weaponry, our, our latest uh, military jets. They field test 
the latest weaponry on Palestinians, mostly in Gaza. They have a strong security industry. They're probably one of the, they're a major arms exporter. Now think the Palestinians do not have one airplane. They have, I remember in Beirut, Palestinians driving around with trucks shooting up in the sky at F-16s who were flying in from the Mediterranean thousands of feet above them and bombing. You know, it's futile. They don't have the weapons. They got a few, they, they got a few missiles now. Uh, but a lot of them are homemade. And I mean, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a nonviolent person, so I don't endorse missiles, but I understand why people want to fight back. So it is no, the, the idea of conflict usually implies two equal sides. And whether or not you think of it that way, I think it plays out that way in the media a lot. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I use other terms. I use struggle. This is a political, religious struggle for justice. So I, I try to stay away from that parity. It's not two equal sides. And uh, so anyway, so yeah. I guess that, that, that's it. Thank you, Don. I, I appreciate that because we at St. John's have a pretty active Holy Land group. And, yeah, I've heard. And I've used the term as a Palestinian. I've used Palestinian-Israeli conflict my whole life. Yeah, well, and, I did and, too. And here you are, um, you know, opening my eyes to the, yeah. the use of language and how language can be so powerful and influential right. in the way that we see things. And, um, and I'm sharing that because... I, I get the sense from your book that this isn't just this memoir isn't just about you telling your story and capturing kind of these big transformations that happen in your life, but there's a there's a built-in plea in this book for your audience to also be courageous in waking up to right. the reality of what's happening. In fact, you you tell a story that I found really powerful, and I'd love to share it with the audience tonight. That when you were in Princeton your first year, and you, you talked about how you uh, took a class with Richard Shaw, the liberation theologian, and you were starting to really struggle with what you believed and what you're starting to kind of see. Yeah. And, and there was some major kind of conflict and inconsistencies there. Yeah. And so in some people encouraged you to go to the Princeton director of Young Life, uh, who told you to question everything. And, and you, you wrote, he said that this is a good problem to have. Yeah. Take this opportunity to see what you really believe and why you believe it. Eventually, a new theological framework will emerge. That must have been a very courageous thing for you. Oh. And, and for well, also for those who pick up your book, well, there is an invitation to courage in there. Now, thanks for raising that. Yeah, that was, I was really... Sink, sinking, you know, struggling with my old evangelical uh, narrative uh, that didn't really have much at all, if anything, about justice. Uh, and it was more of a top-down theology in many ways, uh, not the bottom-up to be with the, the poor, the refugees. Um, so he just shattered her to and got me back to a different Jesus. I needed to see a different Jesus that I embraced. And uh, Shaul actually didn't talk a lot about Jesus. Hmm. <laughs> he was doing a lot of the political theology and all that. But what it did was it got me back there. And when I went with this to spend time counseling with this fellow, he said, you know, 10 years ago, I came to Princeton a lot like you. And uh, what I learned was uh, just to ask the questions. Take it deep in your theology and your personal faith, your spirituality, your politics, and question Shaw, all the other professors, and even question the Bible. And he said then something, you know, Jesus and the Bible can take it. The question is, can you take it and learn and grow? So that really, that, that helped me a lot. Thank you, Don. 
Yeah. Let's open it up uh, for some questions, and then I have some a uh, few others. There's mics on either side right here. You can walk up to them. Also, for those who are at home um, tuning in via Zoom, uh, if you'll just raise the electronic hand, Bill will call uh, on you and invite you and unmute you and invite you to speak. So let's just take a moment now. Come on up, right to a microphone, please. You know, as people come up, I want to make one more point very clear. This memoir is really not about me. It's to point to these people, the Palestinians, the Black Americans, who are victims of racism, of injustice. And this is why I called it Glory to God in the Lowest Journeys. And it, it really is how these people have transformed my life. And that's the mission yeah. I'm all about. And it's also God's mission. I believe as a Christian, this is what I was called to do. And it, it is a, a type of calling because it, it ain't easy. Uh, but once it gets in your blood and you see these issues, but then you see the humanity and the love of these Palestinians, there's nothing like Palestinian hospitality. Uh, it is remarkable. And many of you have experienced it. I might be overstating it because I can find that in love. Latin America and in Africa too, but there's nothing like Palestinian hospitality for me. And uh, I guess that's why I finally woke up and married a Palestinian. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just introduce yourself and then, and then ask your question. Hi, my name is Lynn Wood from Good Shepherd Church in Silver Spring and also the Holy Land Committee of the diocese. Oh. Um, this is my question, and it's about something that hasn't happened yet, but that is being widely advertised. And it's the three-part series that begins on PBS this Sunday, yes. and that has to do with, <laughs> is that your question? <laughs> and and the, the fact that people not being received, the Jews not being received, and I haven't, of course, haven't seen it yet, but I have a concern that this is going to raise up uh, a narrative of anyone who opposes what's going on in Israel is this, uh, the same people who are opposing yeah. um, the coming here. So that's my question. Yeah, I, I, I want to add to that, too. It's been worrying me. And I have the same history with the father who was away during the war mm -hmm. and a mother who was waiting for a 14 year old to get off that ship. Mm. We had, um, I mean, I was very little, but, but my mother always talked about the, the child that didn't come because she had signed up to get one of the children on that ship that docked and then um, was sent back and went back to Auschwitz. And it worries me because the irony of it is, I'm sure the film is going to concentrate on the fact that our government didn't give us an honest portrayal of what was going on in the Holocaust. So the irony is our government is again, not giving us an honest portrayal, yeah. but I'm worried about the sparks that are gonna come <clears throat> from that. So wondering yeah. how you're gonna respond. Yeah. Not all of us are gonna respond to it. And if some advice would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I haven't seen it. I've heard about it. Um, and uh, I think the first thing I want to say is we have a responsibility to stand up against any form of anti-Semitism. Amen. You know, it's a form of racism, but it's also dehumanizing the image of God in a people. So I started my journey on the Middle East really marching uh, and standing against the Nazis when they were in Skokie, Illinois, trying to get a hearing. And it was terribly anti-Semitic. So I will always stand with my Jewish sisters and brothers. Um, but we are in a period where I think there some, some Jewish friends are very critical of how uh, Zionism and the Holocaust are being used uh, you know, to, to really shut down the Palestinian narrative. And uh, I think we have to watch that with care, uh, with great sensitivity, and not just jump on uh, attacking it uh, without recognizing that uh, it's a legitimate case. M much of it happened. But if we ignore what's happening in the Gaza Strip, the theft of land, uh, the abuse of children, 
in the name of Israel and then Christian Zionists in God's name, justifying it and giving it cover, um, then we have to speak up and we have to be careful. And it might be good to do that with progressive Jewish friends who can help guide us through that sensitively. But uh, yeah, I think we're in a period now where uh, many of these things kind of market uh, you know, the Holocaust in, in such a way that it's that it really overrides an injustice of another people. So we got to be both and we got to be completely consistent in fighting uh, anti-Semitism and racism, but we can't allow that to silence us and intimidate us uh, when another when we know another justice uh, is taking place. Mm -hmm. So that's that's all I can say, and I haven't seen it, so I don't want to prejudge right. it. But thank you for the question. It's an important issue. Thank you, Don. I want to take the next question from our Zoom audience. Um, uh, Bill, if you'll call on someone for us, please. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, Philip Farah has his. We've got a few hands up, but Philip, why don't you uh, begin? With your yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Wow. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm still uh, about 80% through the book. I haven't read it all, but one of the other, many parts really, really hit so hard, uh, but one that I'd like you to um, mention to the audience is uh, when you get it, you were getting some psychological uh, um, counseling, and um, if you can talk about that, I thought it was very powerful. Do you remember that part in the book that he's referring to where you were getting some counseling? Uh, was that, Philip, from the, uh, when I met the Young Life? professor and was working through my theological questions. He said, live the questions. Is that the part? Bill, you may have to re, uh, you may have to ask oh. Philip to unmute himself. Yes. I, I think, it, no, I think it was about how um, you were having such a hard time dealing with uh, nightmares uh, and. Oh, uh, that was uh, another. Oh yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I was with the uh, group of relief and development people in Beirut, largely, and we got under the bombardment, um, we were under the bombing for five, six days. And really, I mean, that's nothing. But, you know, we're kind of sheltered Americans. We don't have that every day. And uh, I, I just think of what the people in Gaza feel in, in the uh, PTSD that comes from them. But when I went back, I began to have nightmares. Uh, never had that before. And it was a recurring dream. When I was uh, in college, I worked at a steel mill in Buffalo, New York, where I grew up. And um, the dream was reliving this experience. A friend of and I were up uh, knocking pins out of ingot molds. You know, the steel is poured and then it, then it kind of hardens. And then we were knocking the pins out of the mold. We're up in a bench about 12 feet above the pins. And this is a real thing that had yeah, happened yeah. to you. Yeah, yeah. This is what happened. Uh, he was a great football player, starting center for the University of Pittsburgh. And I was just a scrawny baseball player. But we became really real buddies. And one day he said, Don, look out. Uh, and we looked back. And the crane was coming toward us and it was dumping hot molten steel out and was coming toward us on the bench. So we ran and jumped off the bench and it followed us. You could hear this, you know, the sand sizzling behind us. So that was a little strange. And we uh, finally, we went over and the supervisor came out, called the guy from the crane down and uh, said, what the hell are you doing? And he said, uh, no, I thought I'd just shake up these college guys a little bit. <laughs> well, he was totally drunk. So he was fired on the spot. So that dream came back to me after I got home from being in Beirut. I would have that dream. Have you ever fallen asleep and kind of mm -hmm. your arm falls asleep and there's all this? I would wake up yelling because I thought uh, steel was being poured on me. Mm -hmm. And then I went to a therapist and got me in touch with that original experience uh, in college. 
and worked that all through. And, you know, after a few sessions, no more dreams, no more nightmares. But I had to work that through. But I can't imagine now what the children of Gaza, what these kids in the West Bank who are tortured and imprisoned have to go through, uh, bulldoze families and homes and all that. So as an American, <laughs> my experience was mild. You know, I got out, I worked through it, uh, but they don't have those same resources. So it's all the more reason that we should be called to them to lift up their story and change the situation. Thank you, Don. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, Don. My name is Jessica Sun. I'm a practicing Catholic from St. Mark Parish in Vienna, Virginia. Great. Um, I'm an engineer by day, but I've been doing a lot of volunteering um, outside of my job the last five years or so. Virginia itself is a stronghold of Israeli government contractors. And even on the left, I feel that um, sometimes it's anything but Palestine or anything yeah. but Israel and Palestine. So um, for young organizers or young people getting involved and unlearning so much and also trying to learn so much of our real history, what are some of your favorite resources or conversation tactics in trying to just educate your neighbor? Yeah, thank you. Great question. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think uh, it would be, there's a lot of Palestinians here and find the different Palestinian groups or in your church, a justice group like you have here and become part of it. Uh, find what people are reading then stay real current. And I mean, I've heard about a lot of these contracts and they're quite tricky and they need a lot of research. And there are groups working on them. And I think to get involved and use your skills and go deep into that, uh, carefully researching it, uh, but with skilled people and use your own gifts, this was a, we need that. We really need that in the movement. And I'll tell you another one. Um, this may not interest you, but it's another type of that. A lot of the Christian Zionist groups and the pro-Israel Zionist groups get uh, a tax-exempt status. So you have fundamentalist churches giving millions of dollars in some cases to settlements, which are on stolen Palestinian land. This is a violation of our tax codes, but no one is challenging that. So that would be another one. And then, you know, the boycott divestment sanctions movement, uh, the BDS movement started by Palestinians and civil society, the largest civil society movement in Palestine. And now a lot of Jews worldwide are involved in it. Churches have embraced it. Um, that's another one, uh, you know, that you could really be be involved in and some of the uh you know these uh, israeli institutions who are around here yeah i mean they I, I know there are some in virginia who are linked with settlements and manufacturing goods in virginia they need to be challenged yeah i think our uh, state legislature has a office paid for by virginia taxpayer dollars for israeli yeah um, office yeah. and virginia yeah. coalition for human rights wow. organization. so i love all great them. Thank you for raising the question and thank you for what you will do for justice. Thanks. Thank you. And we're going back and forth between the live audience and the Zoom. So I'll take another question from Zoom and then we'll go to Jim Covey. Sure. Uh, and we do have a fair amount of activity here. So thank, thanks everyone for your patience. Uh, so I'm just going to read one of the questions that came in the chat from Peter. I apologize. I don't have your last name. So the question is, what is a good retort to those who claim the Bible asserts that the that Palestine is given to the Jews. <laughs> okay. Um, well, there's several. Um, one is uh, I think if you look at the sweep of Scripture, there are different narratives in the Bible. It's a complicated book, so you can find narratives that really say God gave the land to the Jews, and it, that also embrace and endorse war to drive the indigenous people out. The book of Joshua is classic. So you do have that type of a narrative, but you also have other narratives in scripture that are more, I'd say, inclusive and include justice. Even they slip through here and there in the Torah. In Levit Leviticus 18, 
there's a discussion of keeping the covenant and keeping Torah. And it builds up to a powerful verse that says, if you don't keep the covenant, the land itself will vomit you out. That's pretty graphic. And the land, and, and indeed, the Jewish people lost the land at least twice. Uh, so that should tell us the land is not the priority. The primary problem is that the land today, under Zionism, Christian Zionism, the land becomes an idolatrous tool. It's a problem of idolatry. And that's the sin that is most grievous to God and to the prophets. So the land belongs to God. And this is consistent through scripture. Uh, the land begun, belongs to God. And those who live on that land must be judged by keeping Torah, honoring even the sojourner, the foreigner in your midst, protecting them, not stealing their land. And the prophets are quite clear on this. And, uh, and then think, just think about Jesus who said, uh, I have nowhere even to lay my head. The land wasn't a priority for Jesus because God belonged, uh, owned the land. And people shared it and welcomed them with hospitality. So the land belongs to God. Israel can lose the land if it violates the Torah. And the big danger is that you might make your country, your nationalism, or the land an idol. So that, that will allow you to do anything to the neighbor, uh, which is a violation of the Torah and of the Ten Commandments. So... A good book that gets you started is uh, Walter Brueggemann's The Chosen. Uh, Brueggemann changed his position on the land, and this book brings it out. He's probably the greatest living biblical theologian. Thank you, Don. That's wonderful. A great resource. Jim. Just one short thought. Um, is that bad? One short thought. You talked about PBS and the Holocaust film by Ken Burns. All of you should be writing PBS and Ken Burns to ask him to do a special on the knock. That's what we need, something to knock Oh, good that point. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. Uh, he's, go ahead, Don, do you want to do that? Yeah, great thought. Wish I had said that, but there are wiser people here than me. He, he suggested write Ken Burns and ask Ken Burns to do a series like this on the Palestinian Nakba, the catastrophe, and its aftermath. The Nakba wasn't over in 48, 49. It continues. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jim. All right, uh, uh, another, another comment from Zoom, please. Sure, uh, uh, we have Shelly Fudge on the line. Shelly? Hi. So. Um... Really good to see you, Don, and I believe that quite a few of you know that I'm with Jewish Voice for Peace. Um, here in D.C., we have a chapter that covers the DMV. Uh, I'd like to bring up, and it's very related to that um, Holocaust series on PBS, is that our own county here in Montgomery County, um, it, there, there's something that everybody, I hope, who are residents here will take some action on. The county is considering adopting a resolution on what's called the IHRA, which stands for the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance Definition of Anti-Semitism. It's very, very divisive. And it's actually quite dangerous. Um, it equates uh, any criticism of Israel as anti-Semitic. And that's of course really uh, a huge problem because it affects our freedom of speech. It started out with Betsy DeVos um, who had used it on the Trump administration um, to impact colleges and to try to uh, remove funding for colleges if they allowed for protest by their students and faculty. Um, it has been spreading now across the country. Not only is, was there an executive order 
um, that also still really affected um, education at the federal level, but it's been spreading uh, in localities and statewide across the country. Um, and uh, something also already was passed by the council, the DC council, um, and also in Arlington, Virginia. But we're trying to stop it right here in Montgomery County. A number of us are meeting with our council members, but what we really need is a lot of you to speak up and to make calls to the council members if you can. We're working on a new action alert and we really would invite you to uh, participate in the effort. If you have any questions or you'd like to talk about this more, feel free to contact me. Shelly Fudge um, and my uh, contact information is scfudge at gmail.com. And you can also look us up um, online at um, JVP DC Metro. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you, Shelley. Shelley. This is very important, really important. This is something we can all do. Save our First Amendment rights. Uh, this is a campaign, Jewish Voice for Peace is probably the fastest growing Jewish organization in the United States. Many of them are under 40 and just are not buying the old Zionist narrative. But they, are, they do their homework. They analyze and organize. And there's no reason why churches can't twin with them because this involves all of us. Now, this is to shut down our free speech uh, on Israel, and it can spread to other issues. So I would really encourage you, go to the JVP website, contact Shelley, and work with them. And uh, I, I would love to see churches here get behind this to really save the First Amendment, because it does stop typical, normal criticism of Israeli policies. Thank you, Don. I didn't see who came up to the microphone first. Okay, please, uh, if you would just thank you. Introduce yourself and ask your question. Yeah, my, my name is Mary Nesnick, and I really appreciate the work that you've done, Don. And I'd like to go back to Christian Zionism because the Episcopal Church had uh, a resolution that was tabled temporarily um, criticizing it as an ideology and it, the mixture that really becomes the base for lobbying within the Christian community. I have not read your book, but I know that North Park was a place where you had a conference on Christian Zionism. And what happened at that conference? And is there sort of um, a mixing of the international um, presence of another country with decision making at the grassroots level, so that in in effect, some of the entities of the Jewish faith become emissaries of another government, or they become carrying out the orders of another government. And that case study of what happened at North Park and your study of Christian Zionism felt like a First Amendment event. And I don't know if it's in the book, but it was a very chilling it is. story. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. It this is uh, someone who has really done a lot of work on this issue of Christian Zionism. I think grew up very evangelical like me, which is fine, but then began to see the light on and broadening uh, our, our passion for justice. Yeah, so at North Park, um, I was a professor and directed a Center for Middle Eastern Studies. And we brought students from Palestine over, had all kinds, of, but we had like a monthly lecture series. And we decided to do a conference on Christian Zionism. So I was able to raise some money and bring in the leading gurus on the issue, Gary Burge and uh, a, a number of others. Gary was at Wheaton College at the time. So we had this conference and Gary, insisted, he said, well, there's a rabbi who's been visiting us I'm really intrigued with. I think we should invite him. And I said, no, I know who this guy is. Uh, uh, I, I've got other rabbis, but this person really has an agenda. So anyway, I relented and said, well, let's, what's the heart? Let's invite him. So we had several lectures and then the rabbi stood up and he did a diatribe against Naimatik 
Stephen Sizer, who mm -hmm. was a leading uh, theologian on Christian Zionism, and me. So, okay, I got up after he was given uh, 20 minutes. He took 43. So I got up afterwards and said, um, well, you can't blame us for being one-sided after that. Uh, and we'll have to cut lunch short. So I'm really sorry. But anyway, so that took place. Then I began to be very closely monitored. Um, and uh, I adopted as a Presbyterian, I'm a Presbyterian, was working on adopting a uh, resolution on BDS, Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions. Uh, I became a spokesman for that in the area. And I think that drew uh, a lot of the scrutiny from the Board of Rabbis and a few others. And I had a lot of support from the Jewish uh, community. But what they did was they really played a strong game. It's, it's in the book mm -hmm. uh, with the administration. And uh, we raised all of our money for the center, all of our activities outside the university budget. And uh, pretty soon I got a call in. I could see it coming. Uh, we're going to have to shut down your Middle East Center, uh, which was kind of a crime. Why? Well, because of financial arrangements. You know, we just, there are budget cuts coming, so we're going to have to cut it. I said, it's not about finances. I know it's outside pressure. Then that was cut. Uh, I had already lost tenure for similar pressures. And then finally they said, okay, you're gone. Uh, you will be released. We're not renewing your contract. And uh, this was also a, a real learning time to deal with my anger and resentment for this injustice. Um, but what I did was I, I went in, had a, I was supposed to have a final meeting with the president and uh, his secretary, who I knew very well, and she was a good friend, uh, said, oh, I got to step out. I got a few errands to run. So I got a little bold and I went through the appointment book and I saw that the board of rabbis and the uh, uh, Jewish Federation were in his office every month for the past eight months. And then when I met with him, he said, uh, no, this is purely a financial matter. I didn't tip my hand. I said, I know it's because of outside pressure. They wouldn't accept, admit it. And uh, I went to see a, uh, a lawyer who specialized in these cases. And he said, I think you got a winnable case, but do you have the finances to deal with the uh, continuances? The university has unlimited funds. And I didn't. In fact, I was trying to sell a house that was underwater. <laughs> so I, uh, I relented. And I had to start meditating. It took me about three months to let go of my anger and get over it. That's the best thing I did, just to turn that over to God and uh, trust another door will open. And the Sabil door opened. Mm -hmm. And uh, it allowed me to talk, learn, study, go to Palestine without any of that critique. So that was liberating. Thank you, Don. Yeah. We're going to take questions for only 10 more minutes, and then I'm going to close uh, our meeting, please. Uh, I'm Zach Murray. I'm working with the NNI Central Committee as a legislative associate, working on Palestine issues and, oh. and some other things. Uh, my question is, we barely touched some of the contemporary issues. How do you see the rising uh, grassroots in a lot of times militia, uh, militant national uh, Christian nationalists grounding a lot of the these ideologies into the political fronts? Uh, and how do we how do we as I mean even as youth kind of combat these within the political sphere? Yeah, I, I mean it's it's a it's a serious problem, and um, well I I think we have to learn how to love them with justice. Uh, and, you know, attacking and angry attacks uh, aren't, aren't going to cut it. There are sisters and brothers, but at the same time, they're terribly misguided. They bought, they have bought into a heresy, and now it's extremely politicized. And we saw it under the Trump administration. 
Mike Pence, Pompeo, but also how Christians United for Israel and others lobbied for the move of the embassy much more than the mainstream Zionist uh, lobbies. So Trump himself said on a campaign stop in, uh, in Wisconsin, we did it for the evangelicals. Now he said, vote for me. You know, we did it for the evangelicals. And 81%, I think, of evangelicals voted Trump. And this was one of the reasons why. So, um, I, it's not just the. In other words, it's not just a theological conviction. Oh, it has direct. Political... No. In fact, I'm trying something out in my analysis of Christian Zionism to say that Christian Zionism is political support for Zionism and the state of Israel. It's political, and I did not have that position when I researched and did my doctoral dissertation on Christian Zionism. I thought all those early, I call them now precursors, who saw an Israel at the end of time, or who talked about you know, all, all kinds of things, the restorationists who wanted the Jews to be converted to Christ and move back to Palestine so that Jesus would return. They did not have a political program, but the political program starts before the World Zionist Congress. The first lobby took place in Chicago with William E. Blackstone in 1891, where he had a national petition drive to get President Harrison to create a state for the Jewish people because of the pogroms. Yeah. That, uh, he lobbied. He had tremendous support. Uh, so anyway, this is not new. But now it has become a major factor in our political system. It's dangerous, it's very racist, and I, I think we can approach it by a careful application of scripture, uh, many verses that will apply to it, but it's tough. My family, much of my family is wedded to these doctrines. Uh, they won't listen to my arguments. Some of the stories might break through. In a couple of cases, Introducing them to Palestinian Christians who have lost land and suffered. Your dad's story, your story, that sometimes will humanize it. So, I mean, it's many of these things that have to be tried. You know, try what will work. Um, I propose something in the book that's a little more radical. And that is to get some major law firms to dry up the tax exempt status. That will get some people's attention. And to bring some of these issues uh, to see if we'll get any congressional support. We won't at first. But I think to hit the pocketbooks and, and, and challenge the illegality of this and what it's doing to Palestinians, Christians, and Muslims, it's not good for Israel. But mostly, Palestinians are paying the price. Thank you, Don. We're going to take one last question from Zoom, and then we'll take the uh, two who are standing in the room. Uh, go ahead, Bill, who you're going to call on. Yeah, Mr. Healy, um, thanks for your patience. Bill, um, I, I think my question's more or less been answered. I think you're probably better off to move on. Thank you, Langdon. Well, OK. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks, Reverend Don. My name is Paul Costello. Um, this is Paul. Who sorry, I've heard a lot about you. Thank you. I've heard Reverend, about you, Reverend. Yeah. To Reverend. I, well, I we'll meet that. later. Thank you so much for all that you do and all that you've done. I'm going to ask this of you, but because I'm asking it of me, I love your story about being called by a black church to be the assistant pastor, and it just raises the issue for me as I'm a, an American Australian white, and I. My life in the last decade has been so embroiled with Palestinians and particularly Gazans that I live with their story. And yeah. then I get the opportunity, like you, to tell their story. But I just want, how do you grapple? You're sitting next to Sari, yeah. whose father is Naim. Right. And it's like, it, we dealt with this in the 60s, white people like me supporting the black brothers and sisters yeah. in their fight. What is... How do you grapple with the fact that we are telling their story? Now, we do have a story. You have a story as an American, and you feel complicit and everything else as I do. 
So that's your story. It's an American right. story. Yeah. But like you said, I, I can, can hardly imagine what the Gazans would feel like. Well, I know there's two of them in the back row. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Lai 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 and and um, Ahmed uh, yeah. are from Gaza. Right. They can tell you what it's like. They lived through five wars, and I, they're my family. They're my my sons, but my adopted sons. But I guess I always just feel like we have the privilege of telling stories from our own experience, which is lived, and you saw the horrors. But there's no survivor of those refugee massacres on the stage. Right. Yeah. And it's their story to tell, it seems to me. Yeah. And all that we can do is be humble witnesses. Yeah. But we certainly can't speak. I don't know. Can you see what I'm sort of saying? Oh, absolutely. I feel the, is there a danger here of our white privilege, even in our benevolence, being yeah. continuing an act of oppression because we are stealing their voice and stealing their story and that you should have somebody on the stage with you from Shatila or from the refugee camp or should reference yeah. that. Or like otherwise, even in our goodness, we are still overwhelming the voiceless. And that's yeah. what I grapple with, yeah. struggle with. I wonder how you struggle with, because I don't know the answer. Yeah. Wow, Paul. Thank you. Shaking things up in the final yeah, hour. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I really feel that, that uh, um, the danger is that we do co-opt their voices and uh, we have to, you know, center them more. And I think, uh, you know, here, I mean, I'm kind of fading out. I'll be dead and gone in a few years. So um, this is kind of my, one of my last acts, in, you know, in terms of doing this. But I, I, I just want to try to make the point that it's a humbling experience to have the opportunity to lift up these other voices. But the point to the injustices and my responsibility in this country you know, like what that uh, the sheikh said, go and tell the truth. And then to realize that my government did not live up to a treaty to protect these people. Very few people know this. And this has continued. And because we have not held Israel accountable for that massacre, it's gotten worse today. So I think if we can, I mean, for me, I want to live up some of that and own that as an American and own uh, that we need to shift our focus to the Palestinians, not at the price of uh, Jews and anti-Semitism, but I just want to try to sharpen our analysis and do what I can. And the churches are one place that I think I can make a difference. But then, you know, I have to try to make sure that uh, when I appear, I should be appearing with Palestinians. Thankfully, it is tonight. And yeah, and tomorrow night, come to Busboys and Poets. You'll hear from a Jewish nurse who was in the refugee camps who witnessed some of the slaughter. You'll hear from a Palestinian survivor of the Saber Shatila massacre. And then you'll have to hear from me. Uh, but I mean, that's much better uh, an approach. But you're absolutely right, Paul, you know, that we, we really should be uh, staying more in the background and pushing the Palestinians out front. Don, I, I, I'm thinking about when Jesus healed um, individuals and he would say, go back and tell what God yeah. has done. I think that there is a lot of power when a, someone from a community is transformed and returns to that community to speak. Mm -hmm. So I, I hear that also your primary, I mean, there are many Americans who would not even pay attention to a Palestinian telling their story, but yeah. they might listen more to yeah. one of their own yeah. saying, I used to believe what you believe, but here's what I saw. Right. So I do, I do think that there is a lot of power and yeah. there's a, a there's there are circles where your voice is way more profound and influential yeah. than well my voice. Yeah, know? I wish it were different, but one day it will be. But I think we also, and I hope you heard me, that this isn't really about me. It's about this issue, this right. cause, God's calling to justice. Uh, it's not about me. 
you know, I tell a lot of my stories, but it really is about the Palestinians and the progressive Israelis who are paying the price to stand with us. You don't. But I really honor this question, and it is something I really struggle with. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yes, thank you. Last question, just an introduction, and then please uh, ask. Hello, my name is Mark Harrison. I used I just retired from United Methodist Board of Church and Society, and I work with uh, 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 Kairos, United Methodist for Kairos Response. Yeah. Uh, we learn a lot from the Presbyterians organized. Well, hey, <laughs> we're, we're still learning. This guy, by the way, has been working on these issues for 35, 40 years. Oh, man. <laughs> uh mine there is now a discussion going on among a number of christian organizations on white christian nationalism yeah is there a relationship between white christian nationalism and christian zionism oh, in your absolutely. view absolutely and then uh real quick uh do you know what happened at the world council churches meeting in Germany. No, and I haven't come kept up with that. It. Where uh, I haven't. No. Uh, you, you know, maybe you're calling me out. No, oh, I man. Know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the uh, it was the first meeting of the World Council of Churches of what was it? How many delegates? Four thousand people were there, and the most controversial resolution was on Israel Palestine. Of course. And no, and this whole discussion about Christian unity was not the major discussion the way some people want to make it seem. So that was a major discussion. And it did include language saying they kind of punted on Christian uh, uh, um, apartheid. Anyway, some of us do believe it's apartheid, but other of us have different views on it. And then they did mention the studies from um, uh, ACLU. What am I talking about? A Amnesty International. Amnesty. Uh, Bad yeah. Salem and six organizations. Yeah, so they mentioned that in, in in the resolution. So that was something positive that happened there. Uh, and then I do want to give a little shout out. I don't know how other people from Maryland feel. I think we should give a shout out to our Senator Chris uh, Chris Van Hollen. Ah, is he perfect? No, no, all of us are not perfect but at least he's been one of the most consistent and strongest voices in the U.S. Senate. And he's really spoken out against the death of the Palestinian American journalists. And yes. he's staying on top of it. Yes, that's yes. all. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Well, I'll just make a couple comments on Mark, Mark's uh, update. Well, first of all, uh, Christian Zionism is a form of settler colonialism and it has supported it. Uh, it, it, it. It provides a cover for the settlements. I told you there are many Christian Zionist churches giving funds to the settlers. They send people over to work the vineyards on stolen Palestinian land. They create a narrative that just uh, ignores the Palestinians as if they didn't exist. It is well, uh, some of the great, I try to raise some of the issues of settler colonialism in the book and link it with uh, liberation theology. But there's a, there's a concept in settler colonial ideology called terra, terra nullius. That means uh, people without land, nobody, no people. And this is kind of what uh, the colonial powers have done. Our country did this with our indigenous people. And this is what Israel is doing now to steal the land and replace the Palestinians inch by inch. And we need to stand up against it. And this is where apartheid comes in. Absolutely, it's a case of apartheid. No question about it. Six major human rights organizations have decided it, maybe seven by now. Even the preeminent Israeli human rights organization, Beth Salem, says apartheid from the river to the sea. Uh, Desmond Tutu, when asked about it, when he visited Palestine, said this is worse than anything we had. It's beyond apartheid. It's apartheid on steroids, you might say. So we can't deny it. But when we raised that issue with our congressional visit today, uh, she said, don't use that language. 
you know, it makes you appear like you may be leftist and people aren't ready for it. But, hey, we need to educate them. We need to raise that question and maybe take Palestinians in with us. So, yes, it's apartheid. Maybe we're a little ahead of the curve where Congress is, but we usually are. So we need to really do our homework and get these what Palestinians and the human rights organizations have done for us. It's right there. Presbyterians and United Church of Christ passed resolutions, but they're up on shelves or they're ignored by most pastors. We got to work at it. So that's something that I can do, you know, as a white uh, Presbyterian. Get that education and get that analysis out to the pew and then Put it into action and in legislation. Yeah, thank you, Don. Yeah, there. Well, um, wait, I want to, uh, and we'll we'll have an opportunity in a second to really show our appreciation for Don. I, I want to conclude with a comment and then a quote from your book, and then um, I, I do want to say that for a long time um, I have been convinced, and even more now, that a big problem is when we label ourselves pro-Palestinian or pro-Israeli. I think that uh, yeah. the, the biggest gift we can give that situation is to be pro-justice. Right. And, and pro-justice speaks for itself. Yeah. And, it, and it allows you to see what you need to see and to see the imbalance of power. Um, but one, one, what I want to end with is a quote um, that I think you highlight. This is a quote by Wes Granberg Michelson. Um, and it's so, yeah. uh, you highlighted how God is present in the mess uh, of life. And I, I want to invite us, we opened with um, a few breaths to center ourselves. And I want to invite oh. us to close um, with this quote, if you will, just um, close your eyes with me and uh, let's just hear the words of grace and peace that are spoken here by Wes Granberg Michelson. The pilgrim's loss of control is a liberating form of surrender. It is born from the countercultural conviction that we are not the masters of our destiny. Rather, in relinquishing ourselves to the messiness of lived experience and to circumstances we know we are unable to control, we discover a presence that has already enfolded us, sustained us, and gone ahead of us. It's grace. Mm. Don, thank you yeah. so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you, Terry.